So um, yeah, very happy to have uh, Lily Liu here from the University of Waterloo. And um, Lily works um, on ways that technologies can help older adults and, and also their caregivers um, to cope with the consequence of dementia. And um, I'm very happy because uh, this, I think, is a very important field that we have kind of neglected in previous meetings. So uh, I'll hand over the stage to you, Lily, and um, here we go. Thank you so much, Thomas, for your kind introduction. Um, maybe just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Yes, we can. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay, good afternoon to all of you in Europe and uh, also good morning to those of you other parts of the world. Um, I'm happy to provide this presentation. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's quite a bit different from the um, previous uh, presentation on uh, using animal models. So I really do appreciate um, you uh, slotting me into this earlier um, uh, time. So what I'm going to be talking about is um, the um, human component, the practice component. We do not yet have um, a, uh, a treatment per se for and uh, to, to prevent or to treat um, or reverse um, Alzheimer's disease or um, uh, dementia. So we still have to um, deal with the daily uh, management of the risks associated with uh, these individuals. In Canada, we have about, our population is much smaller than yours in, uh, out in Europe and in Germany. So we have about uh, just over 400,000 Canadians who are living with dementia. And I understand that jumps up to about uh, almost 2 million or 1.7 million in, um, in Germany. There's about 1% of our population or 2% in, um, in Germany or in Europe that um, uh, are at, uh, that, uh, that, that makes up the, this population. Um, news like this that you see on the slide are becoming more and more common. Certainly here in Canada, we have um, very cold weather and in the winter, we have a lot of uh, very sad news that uh, report cases of individuals um, with dementia at risk of going missing who actually do go missing. In the case of uh, Xin No that you see in the upper right uh, part of the slide, he was a church minister. He didn't want to tell his community, so he is well known, he didn't want to tell his community that he had dementia for fear of stigma, because in the Chinese culture, it's, um, it's, a, it's a taboo to say that you have any kind of a mental illness, and uh, certainly dementia is considered to be a mental illness. About eight years ago, he went missing. Uh, and when the search and rescue um, started to look for him, his community all said they saw him, but they didn't know that he needed help. And so this is the complicated, um, these are the complicated factors surrounding um, individuals who are living with dementia, fear of stigma, and then at risk of going missing and fear of seeking, seeking help. Much of the data that's available, um, you know, you, if you go to any Alzheimer's Society um, site on the websites, you'll see um, uh, six and 10 go missing. And um, you'll see different terminologies in the literature uh, being used to describe wandering. Wandering can be very, um, um, uh, very stigmatizing kind of a terminology. It's used in the US, but certainly I know in Europe and uh, particularly in the UK and Australia, um, certainly when we submit um, abstracts for conferences, they request that we remove the word wandering. Sometimes um, there's research to, to, to categorize them as random walking, lapping, pacing, all these kinds of, of um, behavior, walking behavior that results in an individual experiencing difficulty, wayfinding, and then eventually becoming lost. Um, what we do know though, is that all persons with dementia who are ambulatory or who are still driving are at risk of getting lost and going missing. And that um, this number is uh, rapidly increasing. Whereas one at one time, um, search and rescue cases reported about 5% of their cases involving individuals with dementia that go missing. This number has now increased to up to 50% of cases in some jurisdictions, certainly here in Canada. So this is uh, why we are very interested in this particular topic, particularly with aging now um, increasing and uh, so uh, dementia cases. In a retrospective um, study analysis just done in uh, uh, last year, um, using 616 closed missing uh, persons cases by two uh, urban law enforcement agencies, so these are police services, over a, over a period of about four years, um, the researcher found that community dwelling older adults were more likely to be reported missing, uh, about 53%, and this is not surprising, that um, particularly those living in private residence, about 41%, and they were, they were repeat incidents. And while 48% of missing incidents occurred from one's home, 20% were actually from care facilities, 8% 
on, in a street or roadway, 3% in open spaces and 11% were um, other uh, forms of shelter spaces. So I think um, this uh, is very interesting because most people think that uh, if a person is in a, shell, in a um, facility or congregate living, that uh, they're not at risk of going missing. And that's in fact not the case. And that only just under 50% of missing cases in this study anyway, occurred from an individual's home in the community. Again, uh, research uh, on data is very, um, is very poor, but from what we do know, the risk of going missing um, is associated with a certain level of uh, risk that um, people have tried to quantify. People, some think that if they're not found within 24 hours, um, serious injury or death can occur. Um, in about, and that uh, nearly 95% who are on foot or go missing are found within a quarter mile last thing. So unlike Amber Alert, where children typically are abducted and you're um, given uh, license plates of cars or vehicles to search, individuals with uh, dementia is a very different situation. They typically are not driving or abducted. They are walking and they're on foot. And so the search and rescue strategy needs to be uh, better understood in order to have more effective strategies to locate them, uh, typically closer to where they went missing. So what are these strategies that, um, that uh, we are interested in studying? We categorize them into three areas. One is this whole very um, uh, popular, I think, uh, focus now in the literature and uh, in the communities, and that's what can we do with technologies. But it isn't always about technologies, that in fact, we need to also address the stigma, as I referred to in the first slide, and uh, the culture, and consider the various cultures that these individuals are living in. We also need to uh, build capacity. So what I'm going to do is focus uh, a little bit, spend a few minutes on just uh, what are some technologies, low and high tech devices, and I dare also say no technology. There are individuals, not just necessarily older adults, but also younger populations who would prefer not to use technologies for a variety of reasons. And so sometimes um, a combination of no to low to high tech devices can, um, I think, be the, the best solution. Um, so what we did in this particular publication was uh, we did a review of the literature to look at what kinds of technologies are being used out there for dementia related wandering. So it's targeted at dementia population. We uh, did this review using uh, peer and gray, uh, peer reviewed and gray literature spanning uh, the years 2000 to 2016. This review examined the range and extent of technologies used to manage wandering behavior in persons with dementia. Um, out of 892, only 12 articles and uh, 64 commercial technologies in the gray literature matched our um, criteria. So overall, 83 technologies were included with the majority, so over 70% of these, described in the liter gray literature. And of the 83 technologies, 26 different types of devices with GPS and alarms and sensors, they were the most common. And uh, only 22 of these devices were clinically tested in the home or institution settings. And the benefits did include reductions of risk and caregiver burden. Technologies also were said to reduce risks of wandering, um, but they needed to be affordable. Of course, many ethical issues were also identified, but they were seldom addressed. And um, not surprisingly, none. So no research that we identified used randomized control trials, nor did they use control groups. This uh, speaks to a whole area of research that really needs attention. There's a lack of usability testing and user-centered design. It raises questions about the degrees of effectiveness of these proposed uh, technologies and the accuracy of vendors' claims in their products. Um, and so this, uh, this particular literature review led us down a path of, uh, of a research program to examine um, the adoption of technologies. The purpose of this next study was to examine specifically a uh, type of technology as, or a family of suite of technologies that we procured that met uh, very rigid, very stringent criteria. And uh, we wanted to look at the acceptance of uh, GPS uh, adopted by family, by dyads, we call them individuals living with dementia and their caregivers uh, and the persons with dementia were at risk of uh, wandering. They were living in the community. Uh, we had a group that lived in a rural um, part of uh, Canada and another group that lived in an urban part of Canada. So in total, 45 dyads or um, persons with dementia and their caregiver pairs were, were recruited. 
And um, this study occurred very quickly over a period of one year. Um, on average, they used them for about six months and the GPS acceptance was very high. And in fact, it was so high, our subsequent plan to conduct a randomized control trial was uh, considered to be unethical because um, the uh, health facility that provided these technologies did not think it was ethical to, um, um, to study a group of individuals that were at risk that did, were, did not have access to the technology. According to the participants, the GPS provided caregivers with peace of mind, with reduced anxiety in the dyads, uh, according to the clients that were getting lost. We also um, conducted um, well, in this particular uh, study, we realized, of course, um, this audience would appreciate that when we do uh, prospective types of uh, studies, it's very challenging with individuals who have dementia. Over this one year period, for example, some had to be re relocated to facilities, some passed away. So we um, needed to find alternative ways to also um, a study or understand the adoption and the acceptance of the technology. So we uh, anticipated this was this would happen and put through ethics a proxy um, uh, fo proxy form for caregivers to respond in, on behalf of um, the the family sorry, the individuals with dementia. And indeed we found that there was very high um, association or correlation on almost all of the items. And so that allowed us to complete the study with uh, fewer missing data. We also examined what are the factors that make this collaboration with a provincial health service provider uh, successful. So this has also been published. And I think uh, what's, um, what's um, interesting uh, to note is that this was the very first study in, um, in uh, uh, Canada that uh, had a uh, health um, provider, a provincial health provider that actually uh, issued and uh, cover the cost of a commercial product. Typically they go through uh, medical products, but this was a commercial product. And so I think that's uh, worthwhile. That was worthwhile studying. And uh, this diagram here in the lower corner just shows um, a model that we use to describe the success factors um, pertaining to this particular collaboration that others might be interested in. So the second approach that I like to examine related to um, um, ways to manage risks in this population is in the area of uh, age-friendly communities. Um, this is a terminology used um, a lot in various communities and probably in Europe as well. Um, one age-friendly um, approach to an age-friendly community is uh, this concept of a silver alert. So these are alert systems that would um, let the community know when someone goes missing, um, not unlike the um, Amber Alert that's used in the, um, uh, in the case of children. And the only um, place that we know that have publicly funded Silver Alert programs is in the US. In fact, all but five states in the US have these public notifications that are triggered when an older adult goes missing. So there's media is notified, um, public announcements are made um, also on TV, but if no one really watched TV anymore, but certainly through social media. In Canada, there's currently no silver uh, alert, that program, nor, uh, well, that is publicly funded. There is one that's citizen led in the, in the uh, province of uh, British Columbia. Um, in the, as I mentioned, in the case of older adults who go missing, they're typically on foot. They may use public transportation, uh, as I mentioned, they're not abducted typically. They generally appear like any member of the public. So community members who see older adults tend to assume they're well, unless they want to seek help or they're, um, unless they appear agitated. Um, we also want to respect privacy of older adults. And so we typically don't try to intrude, certainly in Canada anyway. And, um, um, and, and also the number of older adults who go missing far outnumber the number of, uh, for example, missing children. So it's not really feasible to use a similar type of alert system. Um, so what we did in Canada was we developed a, um, an app that's called Community ASAP. And uh, unlike um, a similar app uh, called the Purple Alert in Scotland, um, which is, uh, which is uh, operated through a community um, organization, the Alzheimer Scotland specifically, our app here in Canada needs to be triggered by law enforcement or by the police uh, because of the privacy legislations. You can see that there's intercultural and international um, um, differences in terms of how we issue these kinds of uh, complicated social um, 
uh, strategies to manage. So the way our app works is um, it's voluntary community driven uh, based. And so volunteers, if you want to be extra set of eyes or ears on the ground, you would volunteer to be um, uh, to be exactly that, uh, a citizen that is going to keep your eyes open. You're not going to interview Veen or you're not going to be trained as a search and rescue personnel. But what you will do is on your phone, say that I'm willing to be um, um, a volunteer, a community volunteer, and I'm willing to be able to be on the lookout for someone in these five locations where I frequent and within this particular radius, for example. Um, individ individuals who are living with dementia may want to, just like any, um, any data registry program that exists, may want to register their information or have this information available so their care providers can upload it. So they would enter their personal data particularly um, and keep it updated if they want to. When a person goes missing, then the individual is reported. And uh, if you've signed up to be on the alert for that individual's vicinity, you would get this alert and uh, you would keep an eye on. There will be information as to uh, when you do spot that individual, where to call, what, uh, what to look for, for and how to approach the person. So if the person typically is, um, for example, very friendly, then you can personally go up and talk to them. If the person is typically agitated or um, um, nervous of, um, of uh, strangers, then um, there will be a phone number that you can call typically through to um, the police and also to um, the family members. And uh, when the individual is um, reported found or is no longer, it's a closed case, uh, all of the information online would be um, removed to protect the, protect the individual's um, identity. Uh, this is um, a picture of um, our team in uh, Calgary, working with the Calgary police to test the app with the police and also with the community. And um, we found, um, you know, and Canadians are very, very protective of their privacy. Partly it's because maybe it's driven into us that our privacy is so important and we have laws that protect it. So you can see in some of the uh, uh, feedback that we got back, um, there were a lot of expressions of concern about compromising privacy, that um, release of information may further result in stigma, that this information may, may stay permanent in the public realm, and so they were concerned about that. But um, our counterpart in, uh, we're using Purple Alert in, in, um, in Scotland, um, did not have this kind of um, public concern, so that's interesting. Um, ultimately, though, there is a balance between um, what um, what level of privacy you're willing to give up in order to um, ensure that there is safety or that you are found in a timely manner when you are lost. And so we would get quotes like, ultimately safety trumps privacy. If I can be guaranteed and be comforted by a certain amount of the protection of my data, I'm certainly willing um, to release my information so that I can be found. Um, in an effort to understand this, um, this whole, um, you know, uh, 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 complex issue. We, uh, in the fall of last year, conducted an online national forum on alert systems. We brought in stakeholders from policymakers to individuals living with dementia themselves. Purple Alert from Scotland also attended to present their view. We have a policy brief available to guide anyone in Europe that's interested in starting something like this, and uh, we'd be happy to get some feedback on that as well. So you can just contact me if you would like to, to see that. The um, Next uh, ap approach that the last one that I like to touch on is the third one is building capacity in our communities. And uh, this is a good example of building capacity. This is a program out of uh, one province in uh, out of the province of Ontario from the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. They created a rapid response project, which is essentially a compilation of um, of uh, best practices that police can use. They use this to um, go to the police uh, colleges when they are being trained and uh, spread it out. So we are now in the process, we just received substantial amount of funding to, um, to um, upscale this across the country. So this is one example. Uh, we've published on this as well. So if anyone is interested in looking at um, what, um, what uh, best practice is needed for um, efficacy of, um, of police uh, practices, then um, we've, uh, we started with a review here, which led to, to uh, that project. Um, 
This particular um, project here or research was conducted by my uh, postdoctoral fellow who was a PhD student at the time for her doctoral thesis. And what she did was she developed a uh, conceptual model and strategy for the uh, conceptual model in, in, for the adoption of guidelines of persons with dementia again lost because we were realizing that um, there's lots of lots of uh, solutions and strategies out there but no real model to um, examine the you know human behavior behind uh, using these so the particular model looks like this and you'll see through a variety of focus groups interviews um, um, and also literature review, we came up with uh, these categories of, um, of uh, 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 content that need to, or factors that need to be considered when we're looking at um, how to create an environment uh, that uh, takes into consideration the individual's behavior and the individual's risks. So uh, on the top, you'll see geography. Certainly in Canada, we see that there are uh, rural, urban, uh, geographical differences. So for example, individuals who tend to go missing in an urban site uh, will call the police, uh, uh, their families, and uh, individuals who go missing in a rural site would tend to go to neighbors to, to look for help or a different kind of uh, uh, um, law enforcement or to, um, to other, um, other kinds of uh, uh, resources. We look at cultural and personal factors. So I mentioned in the very first slide in the case of Shin No, when he went missing, part of the issue we thought, we think, and certainly his son now, who started Silver Alert in British Columbia, was one of the co-founders, uh, is now very much promoting the need for um, early adults when they're first diagnosed to communicate that and to address the stigma. And he believes that uh, had the community known his father needed help, they would have, he, he would, be, would have been found immediately and the, his, his uh, missing case would not have been, uh, been you know, so, so sad. Um, so cultural factors, very, very important to take that into consideration. Um, and the risks uh, um, on, in the orange section here talks about the perception of risk. So it very much is um, dependent on what an individual is willing to. So here, what we're trying to do through this conceptual model is to honor the autonomy of individuals, because we are talking about adults, not children, to be able to understand the level of risk that they're willing to, to take. And so um, Nolana has come up with this concept of a Goldilocks model from the Goldilocks uh, principle, uh, Goldil the story of the Goldilocks and the three bears. It's just a just right kind of uh, um, perception of risk, uh, just right or optimal risk perception. So if an individual is very has very low tolerance of risk, they're gonna have all the mechanisms in place and perhaps may need encouragement to go out and um, explore their environment. Others who are um, perhaps more tolerant of risk and who have always been very active, have always hiked, et cetera, may require um, other types of uh, intervention. So it's based on that. Um, she's come up with this, um, uh, this gui guideline essentially three versions, one for persons with living with dementia, because typically they're neglected in these kinds of strategies, another for those who are uh, their immediate caregivers, and then another version of this for, um, for uh, facilities where individuals live. And uh, along with this is um, a list of available strategies. We've now gamified this particular resource so that individuals can access it online. And we can provide that link for those uh, individuals that are interested. Another resource that um, we have developed is a consumer guideline online. So a lot of uh, vendors out there will uh, say, profess that their, their, their uh, technology can do uh, all kinds of uh, interesting, you know, kinds of um, promises, and yet um, um, the consumer is not able to compare apples to apples, or you know, oranges to oranges. In other words, the battery life, the, the cost, and so this allows them to choose uh, and pick the kinds of devices that want to compare, and then we um, they're able to compare them on um, uh, on the level playing field. Um, another resource individuals in this uh, in Europe might be interested in is to join our um, international uh, consortium on dementia and wayfinding. We've held three meetings, Calgary, Edinburgh, and Liverpool uh, already, um, and then the pandemic hit. So we're going to resume these meetings. They can, they've been occurring online as well. This is a, the logos of some of our members. Um, and then I'll just finish up by letting you know about a very exciting um, initiative funded by Public Safety Canada. Uh, we received over 2.1 million to um, 
be able to roll out uh, four deliverables based on capacity building. And one is the rapid response protocol I discussed earlier with the um, police. We're also rolling that out in two indigenous communities because they have overrepresented numbers of uh, people living with dementia. Toolkits for communities that we're rolling out as well. And uh, guideline for return home interviews to prevent missing incidents. This is uh, something that's not practiced routinely in Canada. We adopted this idea from one of our uh, conferences in, in uh, Liverpool, and uh, we're interested in trying this out. I know some parts of Europe also do this. And then data collection, huge part of our project, a third of the funding is going towards looking at how to collect data to um, understand the, the risk. These are the seven provinces that are involved across our, uh, our um, country. And then I finish with this YouTube that is going to be put in the link for you. It's just a three minute YouTube to describe this last, last project. We're looking for um, in interested individuals to discuss and collaborate and share our experiences with. Thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Lou. Great talk. Um, so <clears throat> while we're waiting for the audience to uh, add their questions, also a reminder to the audience, you can already start to enter your questions during the talk. You don't have to wait until the end. Um, so one question I would have, and you mentioned briefly technology for trying to improve wayfinding in, in patients. Um, is there any work that try to use augmented reality? So try to basically display additional information while people are, are moving about in their environments? Yeah, I think um, only in the research uh, realm. So we used to use augmented reality or even uh, tangible user interface combined with virtual reality really to understand um, you know, spatial orientation or spatial disorientation, mm -hmm. what, um, and navigation skills, what are some skills that they use to, but, we, but uh, we've moved um, from that to, um, to just look at really the community response and um, the real life every day, the day-to-day -day kinds of urgencies that are associated with these, these cases. Um, and, uh, but, but certainly there are um, labs out there and uh, we are collaborating uh, with some or beginning to collaborate with some that are using, for example, XR, to, um, to understand uh, how might uh, environments be designed better to, um, to address um, or to provide cues to, in order to facilitate wayfinding. It is difficult with this particular population because of the um, progression of their condition. And typically when, yeah, so, um, so we, we, there is a tendency for that type of research you're talking about, Thomas, Thomas to involve those in the very, very early stages who can still advocate and who are interested in contributing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> um, Michael Hornberg has a comment. He says, to his knowledge, there's only one AR approach more targeted towards indoor activities, <clears throat> including finding a way it's Dorothy.app, do you know that? I don't know, but um, I have worked, I have, uh, yeah, we, um, I am aware of Michael's work as well. So yes, thank you for that, Michael. I'll look into it. Okay, great. Um, I think you also mentioned um, there's very little research on user interface or UX design. Can, can you elaborate? Are there any lessons that you have learned in your work on user interface design? User interface design. Um, yeah, we um, in the several maybe yeah maybe over ten years or several decades ago we started to I worked with a computer scientist um, who looked at uh, using tangible user interfaces to um, look at wayfinding and uh, also to uh, look at cognitive assessment in uh, persons with dementia and so. One of the issues with uh, using computer interface is um, the foreign or the unfamiliar, unfamiliarity of the um, interface. Whereas, uh, so we use, for example, in some of our cognitive assessments, block design. And uh, rather than um, having them um, um, use products that are, um, or do it virtually on a, on a computer, um, we actually, um, with the co collaboration with Japanese uh, researchers, actually made the cubes into computers themselves. And so uh, when we showed them a picture of um, a, a, a cube to design or to assemble, we would give them the cubes and they would click them on and the cubes themselves would have the computer you know, uh, technology 
to uh, then transfer. We use we use um, other kinds of uh, game games, for example, are now becoming much more acceptable. So there was a time when um, games were were not possible, and now um, we have been able to adapt games so that they are familiar, like uh, whack-a-mole or uh, word search and that sort of thing, but customize them with older adults who are um, cognitively well, who tell us that, uh, for example, the um, the um, the uh, color contrast needs to be improved, the lettering needs to be a little bit larger, needs to be adapted and that sort of thing. And we've been able to successfully use them with older adults. I think the idea is that, um, uh, at the one, on the one hand, uh, there was a time when we tried to make the uh, user interface much more familiar. On the other hand, we're now dealing with a new cohort of older adults who are familiar with uh, tablets and iPad and with touch screens. There was a time when many older adults still needed to use a stylus. They couldn't understand <laughs> or using the finger on the, but that's changing now. So I think um, it's really progressing quickly. This um, uh, the boundary I think between the user interface is becoming much more blurred and much more acceptable. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. That's great. So here's a question from the audience: uh, Is there any difference in the patterns of wandering behavior between people living in urban environments versus people living in rural areas, which are assumed to be more sparse compared to urban environments? Yeah, that's a well. What we have. Um, Behavior, that's interesting. I think uh, I think there's definitely a better understanding or appreciation of the search strategies. With individuals who are living in uh, rural environments, they tend to walk, they just, anyway, in, anywhere actually, there's a tendency that they tend to walk uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a direction and uh, even in, and, but you'll notice um, that much more, like in a rural setting, you just see them walking for, you know, um, a long distance and you can still see them until you can no longer see them. Whereas um, um, that kind of behavior in an urban setting is much more noticeable um, because they'll walk, if they see a hedge sometimes in this population, instead of going around the hedge, they'll try and walk through it. Um, whereas uh, someone else who has a different kind of a cognitive condition will, will walk around it. Uh, so that's why the search and rescue strategies have to be um, um, taken into consideration. Um, this behavior. We are working with a, another individual in the U.S. who is studying this kind of behavior. He doesn't have very much data on individuals with dementia, but the um, police police uh, services in Canada are very, very interested in um, in uh, what is very specific and different in walking pattern in in people with dementia compared to <laughs> others. We also know that um, there there is a tendency for them to. Um, try and go back to a place of familiarity. And so that is why it's so important that conceptual model that I presented earlier to understand their history, where they come from. So we have known cases of um, individuals in residential care who are found um, on the highway and that the highway never existed um, when they were younger, but they just know that that's the direction. So they actually do have some sense of direction. That is the direction to take them back to the farm where they grew up or where they used to live and they're trying to find their way back. So once we understand their, uh, their, uh, what's motivating them, the reason for them for walking away, then it's, uh, and sometimes it's walking away because they're agitated or they're uncomfortable. It's not because they're going somewhere. So then we can better treat the situation. 